right uh okay so today what i'm gonna go through right is really just the very fundamental of uh, blockchain like even though you see it's bitcoin here but it's really about why does blockchain really exist because i feel like that that's the fundamental key to when you think about a system right you're not thinking about like this system is a very cool system oh yeah like like why like what problem are you exactly trying to solve right so so that's the angle that i'm trying to go about today so we're gonna start with a bit of history of uh bitcoin because bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency and, and then like we go into like how did they try and attempt to solve the problem that they have so uh I'm just going to show you this thing. Actually, if you're very interested in the whole uh, cryptocurrency blockchain thing, right, I, I would suggest uh, reading this Bitcoin white paper. So they actually go through like the all the technical technicalities of what is it. And then... Uh, uh, Wing, are you sharing yeah. a browser window? Uh, yeah, I am. Oh, I'm yeah, only so, seeing your PowerPoint though. Uh, is it? Yeah. Uh, I think you need to share your, either the browser no, or I, the desktop. Uh, okay, hang on. Ah, uh. sharing. Oh, so it doesn't work like on the screen that I am at. You got to maybe share the desktop. Uh, hang on. Let me see. Uh, okay. Yep. So it's this. Yep. Can you yep. see that? Yeah. Yep. So, okay. So this is actually the Bitcoin white paper. So it's mainly what I will be talking about. Like I will summarize it. Uh, but if you want more details, like. Like this is the first white paper that I read and I was uh, quite mind blown about how they actually go about trying to solve the whole issue. But anyway, uh, let's not go into that. We will talk about this. Okay, the birth of the cryptocurrency, which is the Bitcoin, right? So uh, we're going to bring you back to 2008. Um, if you guys remember, that is uh, the Lehman Brothers crisis which was a very major global crisis that happens because of uh, how they actually mismanage certain financial products. So the gist of decentralization, right? I mean, if you think about that, like they talk about Bitcoin, they talk about blockchain, decentralization, like the core of it is actually really just decentralization. And then why do we need decentralization? We need to examine like, what exactly is it about centralization that might fail, right? So, uh, so this is like just a very simple diagram of what Lehman Brothers is doing. Like if you recall, like Lehman Brothers is actually the fourth bigger financial institution in the USA. So they were ha actually really having some very dodgy financial products, right? So at that point in time, there was a property boom. So people want to borrow money, right? Like want to buy a house, they need to borrow money, right? So so they were uh, okay. So so they will have a mortgage to Lehman Brothers, right? Then Lehman Brothers will give them the uh the cash to purchase their property, right? And uh, so when you have all this mortgage, all this paper sitting around, right? One way of them to earn money from it is obviously from the interest, but obviously just doing it as a, just earning it from interest alone is not sufficient because debts can be very good business as well, right? So they will start to package all this uh, mortgages, everything with probably they mix it out with some financial products and then they'll put it into uh, major financial products and then break it down and then sell to the investor or they start to distribute it. And then so that they can get more money in that sense. So other than earning interest, so they also earn, oh, sorry. Uh, so they also earn from all this uh, package invest, uh, investing products, right? So, so why this system might work, will work, right? Is because your housing properties is assumed to increase in price. So let's say if you get uh, give a loan to say person A and person A try to default it, but because your property is rising, the bank will take hold of your, take ownership of your home, and then they will have an asset that is rising in price so that they can sell it as well, or like they, they want to do something to it, I'm not sure. But, but in that sense, this is how they manage to hedge their risk. But then when the banks, but then there will always be a limited amount of good players who you can loan your money to, right? So when people start to demand more for all these uh, financial products, this debt-based financial products, or however they have been packaging out the financial products, then the bank need to think like, okay, because it's always the bottom line. So, so they will want to go and source for more people to lend the money to, right? Then once all these good actors actually exhaust out, so you need to start to uh, loan out your, loan out money to people who have a uh, worse credit rating. So, in that sense, you increase your risk, but you 
because of the profit that you're looking at, sometimes big financial institution will be willing to take this risk. I mean, like you just seen in 2020 COVID year, I mean, not sure what you guys think about the uh, fiscal policy, but uh, that's another discussion. Uh. Anyway, so, so what happened is because of all these subprime loans, people start to uh, default on their loans. And then the bank, Lehman Brothers, is holding on to a lot of properties. But then you don't have so, so many buyers, right? So, so it's a supply demand thing. When you have a lot of buyers, but you have limited sellers, the price of whatever the buyer want to get will increase because you have more buyer. But then if you have more seller than buyer, then the price of whatever thing you want to get will start to decrease, right? Because you want to quickly sell it off. So that triggers, that is how 2008 actually start to trigger the fall of the financial institution. And then because they also have insurance and everything, and it just start to become very messy. So six weeks after the Lehman Brothers collapse, right? Uh, the Bitcoin white paper, which I just showed you, was actually published. So, uh, but still the bank institution, they play a part in order to manage trust, right? So, so inherently we want to trust this centralized system in order to make transaction with people. So if you want to move away from a centralized system, you want to move to a decentralized system where, where you don't have, okay, let me just show you this. So this is a centralized system, which is the bank system, right? You, you have a single source of a uh, point where you need to trust, right? But when you move into a decentralized system where every single one hold data inside, you sort of, you can trust, you can inherently trust the system because if one node try to, so in, in this sense, like node will be like CPU. Uh, if one node try to change the data, the other, the other nodes will, because they hold the same data, they will be able to see that, okay, like this node try to change the data, right? So this is how blockchain decentralized system enable people to transact with each other. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna go to this website where it provides a very good visualization of the whole system. And that's Yes, okay. All right. Okay, yeah. So uh so basically what blockchain is, right? If you think about it, like blockchain is really just a chain of block. So within all this block, there will be data that is being stored inside. So just now when we talk about transactions, so these are actually just transaction that is being recorded in the block. So when you look at this, uh, all these nodes, they will actually contain data somewhat similar to this, right? So everything has to be made public in order for a decentralized system to work because you want the data, you want there to be a check and balance for that system, right? But then in a way, then you will start to think, right? Like, okay, so I need to make this system public, okay? But how do you actually ensure that whatever information is being trans uh, is being transferred around is a secure data? Is is the correct data, right? That is where all the hashing comes in. Okay, so if you go to so I'm uh, just briefly touched on like hashing. So so it's like basically just for every data that you have, you will produce a different hash, and this is how you actually can check on like uh check whether there's any changes in the data. So, uh, okay, let me just go to this, right? So how blockchain works, right? If you look at this, this hash, right? This hash is actually linked to the next block with, uh, with the same hash. Then you will generate a new hash after that, right? So, uh, so when, I, when, when we look at all the distributed data, so, when you have a blockchain, when you have a different nodes, right? So it's really about all these different parties running nodes together with the same data. So if you look at it, so they all have the same data here. And if I were to try to change something, let's say if I make a transaction over here and I try to change something, I will have a different hash from everyone else, right? So it becomes quite obvious that something has been changed, right? So how it works for the hashing, right? So there will be miner who will be who will have a mathematical puzzle for them to solve. 
So if you look at there's this my button here, it's because whenever there's a transaction that is being sent out, the miner will need to start to mine it. And then you will see that there's a hash change. And then when that happens, then they will need to mine the next block to ensure that the data integrity is being uh, is being preserved in that sense. All right. So so this happens when let's say someone try to change the data as we have seen here. Right. So this this person, let's say PLA is a bad actor, and then he they are trying to change the data over here. They will see that there's now now there's two different chain happening, right? So what blockchain really does, right? It always get the uh the longest chain as the chain of truth. Okay. So let's say if you try to change this, and then you can see that the the further you the further down you try to change the the earlier data that you try to change the more blocks you will have to start to mine. And then that will take the time for you to create the longest chain. So theoretically, it really cannot be done unless you are the honest actor. Because if everyone is the honest actor, the chain that is the honest will always be the longest. So uh, even in the, let me see, where's that? Bitcoin, yeah. So in this Bitcoin white paper, right? Uh, if are uh, very mathematically inclined, they actually calculate the probability of uh, people trying to change the data in previous blocks. So, so the earlier you are, the harder it becomes. Uh, it it becomes uh, the harder it, it is to change the data inside it. Right. So in that sense, um, so in that sense, it's also like if you try to cheat a system like that, because you, so most of the time you will try to change your transaction, right? Because currently, currently that is what I will say most of the blockchain technology is being employed in like recording transaction and things like that. So if you try to sabotage the system, there's a tendency, there's a chance that your, the cryptocurrency that you hold might drop in value because people trust the blockchain less. Right, so people, there's a, so this system is sort of inbuilt in the sense that there's an inherent trust in it. And that is why it become, that's, that's why when you, when people talk about blockchain, they actually talk about like it being a trustless system because it is actually mathematically secure in that sense. It's not like you need to trust a centralized system, like say, for example, like this, right? So in this case, you need to really trust the centralized system to be a good actor. But because of the, the whole system, how it's being built up, right? You just need to have trust in the system that all the crypto, all the cryptography, all the nodes, they are going exactly doing what they are trying to do. I mean, it, is there a way to actually hack the system? There is, if you can actually gain like 51% of the uh, mining power. But then the thing is, if you have a huge decentralized system like Bitcoin, uh, then it becomes very difficult for people to actually have that kind of computer system, a computing system to change the transaction in the whole blockchain. Because uh, I think that time they were actually calculating how much energy that's actually being used by the whole computing system is. It's actually very, very high in, it's actually quite energy intensive and it doesn't actually make financial uh, justification for you to cheat the system, right? But then again, like when you think about it, right? So, so decentralized system gets more secure when there are more people participating as a node. Then you need to think about it like, but why are all these people maintaining all these nodes, right? So that's the problem that blockchain will try to solve. The next problem that blockchain will try to solve, right? So, I mean, like if you guys have been using BitTorrent, right? You know, like all the seeding and sharing or However, like once, once you finish with your stuff, you just take down your seat or your node. And so in the blockchain system, right? If you actually hold a mine and then you are the first person to solve the mathematical puzzle of that block, you will actually get rewarded with cryptocurrency. So when you are a miner, so, so if you look at it, right? This system is quite beautifully designed in a way because if you want to break that system, you need to run a node, right? So if you were to run a node, you get rewarded if you're a good actor more than if you're a bad actor most of the time, 
right? You can try to be a bad actor, but the repercussion of being a bad actor might be psychologically and financially higher than being a good actor. So, so it is in this case, in this system, they will try to make it such that like, so, so it has a lot, a, quite a bit of game theory behind this system where they actually try to think about like, how do you actually make people, how do you actually incentivize people to follow this system? Like just because you have a blockchain system, you have a technological system that might be secure cryptographically, it doesn't mean that people might follow it. It doesn't mean that people might not gain it. So, so you have, once you have like financial incentive to incentivize people to be an honest actor and chances are they might want to not break that system in a way up. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So if you want to see like how transparent this whole thing is, right? Um, there's actually this, so all blockchain, like you, you have like Bitcoin, you have uh, Ethereum, you have like, uh, yeah, some other uh, blockchain. You can all see all the transaction that happens through an explorer. So if you're curious, like you can just type Ethereum Explorer and then you will start to see like all this transaction that happens throughout a throughout the whole I mean all the transaction history uh, uh yeah so uh actually this is my own wallet so so if you look at this right this this uh, there's a transaction of 009 BTC and that's happening on the uh, uh there's a hash here 216F and it's happening on 2018 uh so if you look at this Yep, so 2018-11, and then it's a 0 0.09. I think if I just expand it. Yep, so. Uh, wait, uh, wait. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. It's this hash, F78EDDD. So you can actually see the. The hash being recorded here. So everything is verifiable on a public blockchain. So everything you can actually see what is happening on a blockchain system. And like what kind of implication this is, right? Like, I mean, for now, to be honest, I feel like it's still a bit speculative, but then if you think of the implication, uh, I work in the oil and gas industry. So recently my boss, she actually said like, that's what, that's an issue. I mean, because of the Hing Leong, Hong Leong, I think Hing Leong uh, issues, uh, like banks, I think they are a bit more cautious in allowing uh, credit. What is that called? Letter of credit, like giving letter of credit to, to the companies, right? It's because like they are afraid that this company will take their collaterals and go to another bank to, to get the same loan. Because that, that's right now, there's no system that actually connects them, connects the different bank system. So like trade finance might be like one issue where you can sort of, share data but in a very secure manner and to check like what is uh what is being loaned out and that that could be a good use case for blockchain where we're talking about like places where you really need to trust you you, you need to have certain trust but then you need like the the kind of public trust where yeah in that sense okay i, I think i'm not putting it Correctly, sorry, a, a bit cloudy now, my my my. So, in a way, uh, if you need a third party verification body, and it costs a good amount of money for them to execute that, like blockchain might be a good use case. That's what I think, lah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I am done for now. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, do ask me about it. Uh, okay, so financial general ledger application, you can actually check out and blockchain. I think they meant they actually sign something with DBS and Standard Chartered. I think Standard Chartered of, I'm not sure if India or US, I actually read that they were trying out a POC. Yeah, but I think, 
and blockchain and uh and blockchain BDS. Yeah, so yeah, and group blockchain tra trade platform. Yeah. So there is actually, I think right now it felt like I think it really because I feel like trade finance, there's still a lot of friction. So that is where if you can sort of verify trust without trusting, you know, like, okay, sorry, I think I'm not putting it in the correct word. So if you can inherently trust that the data is correct, yeah. Uh, hi, Wing. Uh, yeah. Excellent presentation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, you was mentioning that uh, uh, all the blogs should be public, right? Uh, so then in that case, how can we secure it? Like, meaning, does it mean that all my information, like anyone can see all those informations? Like what exactly, like, uh, let's say I want to secure it. I don't want like, uh, like if not, I don't want all the public or to see those information. So, um, so what kind of like security uh, or things, uh, you know, we can use to protect uh, unauthorized people to view those information? Okay, so actually, right, mm -hmm. uh, blockchain, although like Bitcoin is a public blockchain, right, that's actually private blockchain and hybrid blockchain as well. Uh, but usually if the blockchain is meant to be public, right, your transaction will be seen on the blockchain because that's how the system is being designed. Uh, but the thing about all this like wallet address, right, so unless I tell you it's my wallet, right, it's almost, I think it's almost impossible for people to actually link it to your account unless, I mean, of course the caveat mm -hmm. is the exchange actually holds your information. So yeah. they know, they sort of know who you are, uh, but because of the whole KYC thing, right? It's yeah. not, I, I'm not sure if there's a way to be totally anonymous in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Wait, do you know of any? Thing, like whether there's a anonymous like backdoor way of like because I, I know like currently mm -hmm. uh of course I think like government is always like trying to regulate and there's a lot of KYC being done. You can if you're interested in KYC uh, which is a government regulation you can check out Rev, uh, Trevor Rule I'll type it in the chat Trevor Rule by F A T F is pretty recent so now uh, the US government they want to regulate anything that is higher than USD $250 in cryptocurrency transaction. So basically mm. uh, KYC have to be done by the sender and also the receiver in different uh, details. So totally anonymous one, um, I don't think that, by definition, I don't think that is like, totally yeah. anonymous. Yeah. Mm, but for uh, on a side note on privacy coins, right, uh, a lot of people are trying to do. But then mm. uh, on one hand, you know, the dark side people are trying to do on the other hand the government will sit down like, because it's yeah. not the interest of the government yeah yeah i should okay. foresee they might do taxation on crypto i'm not sure they might uh, say... in japan it, they are already doing it That's oh, why okay. They, okay. a lot of japanese people they want to move the money out <laughs> ah okay 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 so at least for bitcoin for public blockchains you can run your own you can run your own client Mm. And hold your own private keys and run your own clients. Then yeah. there's no KYC because you're running the mm -hmm. client, just like you can run a BitTorrent client, right? I mean, you, you run a yeah. BitTorrent client on your machine and you can get files and stuff. So you can do the same on Bitcoin, run your own clients, store your own secret keys and so on. Um, yeah. yeah. Then you don't need to submit your address or whatever. It's all on your own machine. Yeah, you can actually do that. Yeah, that's right. You can actually do that. But then once you want to hit the exchange, I think once you want to move anything, then that will be an issue. Unless you do uh Yeah, if you want to get to your bank account. Yeah, yes. yeah, yes. yeah. Those but you can, yeah, ones. but definitely you can own a Bitcoin like that, yeah. Good point, good point. Oh, but also quickly mention you can you can just create a lot of a lot of wallets actually mm -hmm. you don't have to have one you can just create as many as you like it's not like your bank you only have one bank account you can make as many wallets as you like 
and spread your kind of wealth around. Yeah, yeah. I think that's actually what they do. Like the wheels, they will like, if you track, you can see like they actually move things around quite a bit. Yeah, there's actually API. Like if you guys are interested in like how, how all this actually flow, that's, that's API. I think for, I think probably almost all the public blockchain, they will have their API because by right, they are supposed to put their code on GitHub because they want people to run their nodes. So the code will always all be on GitHub and then they probably have API documents for you to see as well. I can take it if you yeah. if you don't want to take it. I think you're quite tired. Ah, okay lah. I, I take, am. I can take Amos' <laughs> question on MA, MAS because I'm talking to them. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, would you be okay, Amos, if I take your question? Okay, perfect. So, uh, MAS, right? You have to, uh, in general, regulation and uh, our emerging technology in general in general in Singapore because I'm not in graph tech so I can speak freely as I want. <laughs> so uh, the, the tech is around three to five years. So uh, for this is a very very concrete example. If you are currently using cryptocurrency and you're using exchange or wallet, so custodian wallet that are centralized like crypto.com which I'll type in the chat. Mm -hmm. If you were to download, uh, okay, crypto.com because Wing and I, we were talking two days ago about crypto.com because we had dinner yeah. together. So if you, if you were to log in and download and log into crypto.com where you can buy, sell and exchange um, cryptocurrencies, right? You will see a sign, like a warning sign saying that, okay, crypto.com, we are not regulated by MAS. So uh, please take note while you do your trading on crypto.com. So what MAS is doing, right, is that uh, currently because of the Payment Service Act, which is PSA, okay, let me type up for this text. Now, Payment Service X actually demands KYC uh, from the sender and the receiver of the cryptocurrency to a certain degree. So as long as you are a custodian wallet or you have any form of Bitcoin or like cryptocurrencies, right, you have to be licensed in Singapore. Currently, MAS is giving uh, all the crypto institutions a period of six months to one year to be licensed, starting from, uh, if I'm not wrong, 2019. So, there is a list on it. So uh, basically, uh, let's say Binance, if you trade with Binance.sg, they are on the list. Like they are either getting a license or they already got the license. So as long as you don't have the license, right, technically you are not supposed to operate in Singapore, which is why probably crypto.com moved. Um, I think the, the tech side, they moved it out of Singapore. So their Singapore office is only marketing side. Basically, uh, the tech side is like a third party. And then they uh, sort of like outsource it into some of the countries uh, that is like very uh, crypto friendly in regulation. So the next question about how MAS is like pushing blockchain, right? Um, through the recent Singapore FinTech Festival, uh, DBS actually set up their own cryptocurrency exchange, which is uh, pretty big news because uh, now it means that our uh, DBS, uh, they are actually <laughs> storing and keeping their own um, cryptocurrency, which means that they can potentially be a whale, a crypto whale, and hence influence, uh, you know, the movement and the price, prices, no, not really prices, because they're too small a player, uh, maybe movements of cryptocurrency, and because DBS is rather legal in a sense, and, uh, you know, stakeholders are pretty much from, uh, need to be careful here, uh, let me think of how to do it. <laughs> more legit people in Singapore, let's put it this way. So uh, there is a form of control uh, more towards the centralized side. So wondering how the government is pushing this tech. I think you can, I mean, I don't know how to put it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tech yeah. is working on it, right? There, there's a few. <laughs> Jack Rubin, thanks for saving me. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a few. Uh, even NPA is actually looking at it. I think there were, there were, that time I was that time when I was doing a blockchain hackathon, I actually spoke to MPA. So they're actually trying to do up some what is that? Uh the one that you actually try to reconcile to blockchain. I can't remember that term. Um so uh, interoperability. Yeah, correct, 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 correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're actually looking at that. So they actually that there, there's a few projects that is ongoing uh, on the government side, but 
I'm not sure if they actually go beyond the POC stage already or not. I haven't been, honestly, haven't been following up. Yeah, but I mean, that's always like, if you go and Google, that's like Project Ubin, all those stuff as well. I think can forget yeah. as and government there because I don't think yeah. they're doing much here. Like, just forget it. <laughs> just forget <laughs> company, Hyperledger, R3 Corda. Yeah, I don't think you care about MAS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, open sets. Yeah. Cool. I think that's, uh, if there's no other questions, then that's it. Thank you for a uh, wing and one way for the sharing. I'll stop the recording now.